me now? You can? Oh, uh, I see that the counselor Stavenger can hear me, maybe? I don't know if I hear the PA on in the room. Can you turn the PA on? And can you keep talking until we can hear you? I can. I love talking to myself while other people are just staring at me weird. We like can hear you. We can hear you. I call the 2378th meeting of the Milwaukee City Council to order. This meeting is being held in person at City Hall and by video conference. The public may participate in this meeting by coming to City Hall or joining the Zoom webinar. 
The meeting is being broadcast live on the city's YouTube channel and Comcast cable channel 30 in city limits. There will be opportunities for the public to speak during this meeting. If you would like to address council, you may come to city hall or you may participate through Zoom. If you are interested in speaking, please let staff know by filling out a yellow comment card for those at City Hall or emailing OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov for those on Zoom. When it is time to take public comment, staff will monitor the comment cards, email inbox, and Zoom participant list and chat. We will take comments in the order they are received and seen. Written comments may be emailed to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. Spanish translation services are available upon request. The public is asked to request translation and other meeting accessibility services at least 48 hours before the meeting. Contamos, contamos con servicio de traducción al español cuando sea solicitado. Se pide, se pide al público que solicite servicios de traducción y otros servicios, servicios, servicios de accesibilidad, accesibilidad para reuniones por los menos 48 horas antes de la reunión. Translation services are also available in other languages. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The city of Milwaukee respectfully acknowledges that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Clackamas people. In 1855, the surviving members of the Clackamas signed the Willamette Valley Treaty, also known as the Kalapuya Etc. Treaty, with the federal government in good faith. We offer our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people of this land. Now move on to our weekly announcements. Uh, the city is organizing an Earth Day volunteer restoration event at the Willow Place Natural Area on Saturday, April 22nd from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Volunteers will focus on removing invasive plants, but if time allows, some planting may also occur. Volunteers are asked to register on the city website, and the link is there on the screen. The Milwaukee Police Department, in partnership with the DEA and the Community Emergency Response Team, is hosting a prescription drug drop-off and document shredding day on Saturday, April 22nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Public Safety Building parking lot. The event, in, the event includes the collection of unused or expired prescription drugs, and a truck will be on hand to shred sensitive documents. Please arrive with all items in a box or bag and remove staples. City Manager Ann Ober hosts another open door session on Friday, April 28th from 9 to 10 a.m. Stop by to ask questions, raise concerns, or just find out what the city is currently doing. The session takes place here in the city council chambers. I'll also add that this Saturday, being the second Saturday of the month, is the uh, monthly cleanup in Minthorn Springs. That goes from 9.30 a.m. to noon. Uh, so come over to Minthorn Springs, which is across behind the new planet, across 37th Avenue behind the new Planet Fitness, uh, and help us pull ivy and blackberry. And uh, if you haven't been in the wetland there, it's it's really a special place. Uh, for more information about each of these events and others, please visit the city's homepage at milwaukeeoregon.gov or call 503-786-7555. Did anyone else have anything they wanted? Yeah, I wanted you did. to say something. I just wanted to remind people that there's a special election coming up for folks who are at home who might be watching this to uh, make sure that you participate in this special election. It's school board election time, so your voter pamphlets will be coming out. Take a look and just know that it's happening. Yeah, it's it's a good point. These May elections don't get as good a turnout, and this is an important election, so thank you for that. 
Okay, we will move on to special report on opiate, opioid settlement funding uh, presented by April Heron from the Clackamas County Public Health Division and Elizabeth White with the Children, Family and Community Connections Division. Usually we, we minimize this, but because our city manager is participating by Zoom, we got to keep it in all four. So I'm sorry to block. Okay, no, this is great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. for thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It's Elizabeth White from Clackamas County Children Family Community Connections. It sounds like uh, <laughs> someone else who may have been in my division at one time. So oh. <laughs> I'm Rebecca. And this is uh, April Heron from Public Health Division. Thank you and uh, for letting us come and present to you today. Head to the, the next slide. Uh, so today we're um, going to April is going to start us off with reviewing um, the impact of the opioid crisis. Um, we're going to provide uh, some information on the settlement agreement background, and then I'm going to discuss kind of the county the county framework that we're using to guide investments, and we'll have some time for questions. Trying to advance yeah. here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Hit the arrow. Yeah. All right. So, so the first slide is outside my office in uh, downtown Oregon City. Um, we are just in this slide. It just shows that um, staff and others. Um, are showing their commitment to lifting up our communities and investment of uh, national opioid settlement funds and prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery programs will help communities in Clackamas County impacted by opioid misuse. And we have the opportunity to address the losses driven by the opioid crisis on individuals, families, public services, and others, and make wise investments informed by data and also have a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the data. So I'm going to provide um, kind of a landscape view of the opioid crisis, what we've been seeing over the last several years. I'll walk you through some national data, also some Oregon data, and then what we're seeing locally. Okay, so what we see here is data from the CDC shows us that deaths from drug overdoses hit over 100,000 during the pandemic. This includes the number of deaths from April of 2020 through April of 2021. And it's the first time that drug overdose hit deaths hit over six figures in a 12 month period. So it was pretty devastating for our country. Overall, the death toll jumped by more than 28% compared to the same time frame the year before. Deaths from synthetic opioids like fentanyl accounted for approximately 64% of the total overdose deaths and approximately 75,000 of those were from all different types of opioids. So prescription, heroin, and fentanyl combined. Uh, this data shows us that there are now more overdose deaths from synthetic opioids than, like fentanyl than there were overdose deaths from all different types of drugs combined in 2016. Um, and that was when our country had hit a pretty high number for overdose deaths and it started getting quite a bit of attention. And the most updated national data that we now have uh, reports 106,000 deaths for 2001, but we're still pending 2001? the pathology reports. You said 2001, you meant 2020? 2021, okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, so here we'll look at um, some recent statewide data. On the left, you can see that Oregon is among the states that saw one of the highest increases in all types of drug overdose deaths, a 26% increase from March of 2021 through March of 2022. And then additional data on the right from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. It's a self report survey that is done every two years. This was collected in 2020 and it paints a very disappointing picture for Oregon. Drug and alcohol addiction rates increased significantly during the pandemic. Uh, Oregon now ranks second in the country for all substance use disorders. 
Meanwhile, we ranked, we have ranked uh, 50th in access to treatment for several years, but since sending these slides on to um, Scott for this presentation, we did get more recent data and there's been a slight improvement. Oregon is now seventh worst in access to treatment. So a small improvement, but still not great. Um, Oregon ranks first in prescription opioid misuse and also first in methamphetamine use. So uh, public health staff um, for Clackamas County Public Health Division, one of the things we do is maintain a data dashboard that includes key indicators of opioid harms. Um, and these include overdose deaths, overdose emergency department visits, EMS transports for 911 calls related to drug overdose, and uh, the rate of prescriptions being written in our county for opioids. Um, and these data are used in a number of ways. One is to help us identify populations and areas of the county that are being most impacted. So that can help us understanding where funding investments need to be made. So in thinking in terms of opioid settlement dollars, we will be relying heavily on some of these data to help us figure out where those funds should be equitably distributed. So looking at some of this local level data, uh, here we are continuing to see increasing rates of overdose in Clackamas County, just like we are at the national and state levels. Drug-induced deaths here come from uh, CDC Wonder Vital Statistics data, and they show 86 confirmed deaths for 2021. This is the highest that our county has ever seen, and it is an 87% increase compared to 2019 when fentanyl had just started to make an appearance in our county and in the state. Um, and I did want to note again for this local level data, the 2021 numbers aren't quite final. They could still continue to go up based on um, toxicology reports coming in. Um, for 2022, we have pending deaths going all the way back to September still. So we don't actually know how that year is going to finish. Um, but based on what we're seeing, it is likely going to um, probably have higher numbers than 2021. And here we're looking at the number of drug induced fatalities broken down by drug type and by year. So as you can see, we've had some tra changing trends over the last few years as a county, and we very much uh, mirror what our, the state of Oregon is showing. So our county deaths related to fentanyl uh, were more than four times higher in 2021 compared to 2019, and those from methamphetamine increased about 72%. Uh, there's a little bit of good news in that deaths from uh, per heroin and prescription opioids have been on the decline since 2020. We're hearing less and less about heroin, but again, a lot of those are shifting over to people using and unfortunately dying from fentanyl. Here we see incidents that required EMS transport for opioid related calls, drug overdose, and events where naloxone was administered. Uh, these come from a system called First Watch that the Public Health Division has subscribed to. It is a real time surveillance data. Um, so if you're looking at the um, list on the left, you can see there by drug type and by um, city on the right hand side. Um, I will say these incidents have increased quite a bit since 2020. Um, you can see that Milwaukee ranks among the highest cities for drug-related 911 calls. This has stayed pretty steady for the last few years since we've been tracking this information by zip code and city. Uh, so from January of 2022 through March of this year, there have been 148 calls in Milwaukee that meet our case definition for this particular query. Um, and then when noted, the majority of these calls include fentanyl, oxycodone, methamphetamine, and heroin. But as you can see, a lot of them still about almost half come up as unknown. And then I'll just finish with the slide before I pass it back to Elizabeth. Um, just wanted to give a little bit of information on the settlement agreement background. I know you're probably somewhat familiar, um, but sharing what we know, approximately $333 million is coming to Oregon as part of the Johnson & Johnson and uh, distributor settlements. Funding is also starting to be received as part of the Purdue, CVS, and Walgreens settlements. 
So the state will retain 45% of those funds and then 55% will come to cities and counties who signed on to the agreement. And you'll see a list of those cities list on there on the right. Defendants will have up to 18 years to complete these payments. And um, we are being told that they will be front loaded in the first two to three years that will receive heavier payments. Um, I know many of us have already started to receive some of those payments um, and there really is no time frame or timeline on when we're getting them. They're just starting to come in. Um, also being told that at the county level, we're starting to receive those payments from uh, the farm pharmacy um, settlements from Walgreens and CBS. So Clackamas County specifically will receive at least 13.7 million. That is before the pharmacy settlements. Uh, and then cities will receive lesser amounts calculated based on uh, population and a list of public health metrics, very complicated list of metrics. And as you already know, decisions about these funds can be made locally. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth to outline our county process and framework for uh, the county funds. Um, so you should have received uh, the uh, Exhibit E, which actually outlines um, the nine core abatement strategies and um, all the strategies in detail. So this is like the high level list of strategies. And we do a number of these things already in Clackamas County, such as warm handoff programs like um, LEAD or Project HOPE, and they connect people to recovery supports, naloxone distribution, and also the programs that prevent use substance use. Um, we uh, work to coordinate our efforts with community partners and meet regularly to, with stakeholders to, stakeholders to discuss how to maximize collective impact with available resources and forums, such as the Clackamas Community Alliance which Chief Strait was actually the chair at one time, Clackamas Prevention Coalition and local groups. We have a lot of great things that are going on at some time. Maybe we have we can present, you know, all the things that we're doing in substance use prevention. Um, and we've, with all these great steps we've made together, there's just critical gaps that remain and there's a lack of capacity to make demands for services. So opioid settlement dollars could enhance and expand many of these great services that are connected to these strategies and provide a more sustainable funding source to strengthen um, current investments that we have in substance use prevention and intervention. So head to the next slide. So this is a very abbreviated um, version of the uh, framework that we're using for planning and implementation. And it aligns with the five guiding principles developed by national experts. Um, and it uses a community-driven, data-informed, collaborative approach to spend money and save lives. Uh, the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health developed this national model and uh, some of the five Principles are spend money to save lives, use evidence to guide spending, invest in youth prevention, which is my jam, focus on racial equity, develop a fair and transparent process. So all of these are embedded within this WIS framework. So the first component um, is evidence, and we're in identifying evidence-based investments through assessment and community engagement, and we're striving to advance equity through the assessment process by identifying populations disproportionately impacted by substance use and looking at specific barriers. And actually this fall, we held listening sessions with stakeholders that provide uh, services and supports to people affected by substance use. And during these sessions, we asked participants to identify service gaps and priorities for settlement funding. And I don't know if um, you received this kind of brief uh, two page document. And I'm just kind of, I'm gonna boil it down a little bit so you don't have to, to go through it. So um, the participants recommended increased investments that reduce barriers to access to workforce, transportation, culturally responsive services, house care, child care, all these things you've probably heard as a committee over and over again, um, ensure equitable uh, funding that lifts up all Clackamas County residents, focusing on youth, Latinx, and rural populations, supporting um, policies and programs and practices that reduce stigma and increase knowledge of services to improve connections to care. A lot of people don't access services because they just feel ashamed and they don't feel like they have the capacity to reach out and ask for help. And then we need more access to these um, evidence-based treatments like for opioid use disorder, which is called medicated assisted treatment, 
be better linkages to treatment, recovery, and harm reduction. And so these are all the things that um, with that our constituents lifted up through these these surveys. And we're also um, fortunate to just have had a listening session with the voices of those directly impacted by substance use. And they mirrored a lot of what is in this document, but um, they also lifted up as important as um, the need for inpatient treatment. We just don't have it in Clackamas County, especially for youth, withdrawal management services, peer resort, peer support services and access to mental health services, especially for youth. Um, so that's kind of that evidence-based piece where we're, you know, we're doing a uh, community engagement plus looking at the evidence to say, okay, where do these investments, where should we invest these funds? And so the middle part is collaboration. And we put this in the middle because it's the most important driver of this process and included in all aspects of this framework. And so we're engaging communities, we're coming to, to you, um, city partners identif to identify funding priorities. Um, we hope to convene a stakeholder group to guide this process for distribution of settlement funds. Again, kind of using all these pieces together to decide how we're going to move forward together. Collaboration is essential for transparency, which is why I've got the little, you know, uh, what is it called again? I can't even think of uh, <laughs> their Sherlock Holmes. Magnifying, said, magnifying glass. <laughs> thinking about Sherlock Holmes. Um, and uh, we are in the process of um, moving forward a policy session on the first use of funding. It's a collaboration across the sheriff's office, district attorney, juvenile department. Our department is H3S. And we hope to fill those critical gaps while we're moving forward this process where we're going to put all this information together and come up with a sustainable long-term plan with the multidisciplinary uh, steering committee. And so all these pieces will be woven together. And I think it's a, it's a pretty, um, it's, it's a process that's a thoughtful, intentional, collaborative, and um, ex I'm hoping that we'll be able to move this forward. And then the last piece, I guess, is save the best for last, right? Why we're here to provide support to cities. So I'm gonna talk while she's advancing it. So um, we're here to provide this great localized data, um, get your response, answer some questions. Um, we've made some presentations to Gladstone, Happy Valley, Wilsonville, and Sandy had a similar type of, of discussion. Um, we talked about the lack of services in Clackamas County to meet those demands. We heard some communities expressed what it is that they would like to see invested. And then we actually have some um, cities that are going to um, provide their funds to Clackamas County because to be able to maximize that investment. So they just, that lower amount, they they decided that they wanted to combine forces and and like the Avengers and we were gonna go tackle opioid misuse together. Um, so we we are here to answer questions um, to if you want us to come back and have more data to share about our projects or specific information you want to know that's that's why we're here so just to clarify there's the county is going to get 13.7 million from one source but there's more coming from pharmacies uh, other yes so they're pending agree you know like they're still working out all the details and so that hours. settlement hasn't shaken out entirely and that's over an 18 year horizon but are you expecting it sort of front loaded or will it kind of right we expect the payments to be front loaded. And okay. so once we get clarity on that, then we can kind of decide what are those, you know, how to maximize those in investments through economies of scale, leveraging mm -hmm. other resources, all that great stuff. And is there a discussion going on between the county and the cities and to, as to how cities share if cities want to spend it themselves? That's why, we're, being that's allocated? why we're here too. So if okay. you've already made decisions about your investment, great. If you want support, fantastic. We're here. We're here to help you decide what's good for your community because you know what's best for your community. I'll just add: some cities are are getting very low amounts, and it's mm. very difficult to to put forward many of those evidence based strategies with a very small amount of money. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think people are coming to those conclusions on their own. What will be the, make the most sense for their city? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Gladstone received, you know, a much significantly lower. So they were like, oh, you are doing a lot of great things. Why don't we just, you know, right. contribute to that? Right, right. We haven't had any discussions. I do know the city manager has 
had discussions with people? Is she raising her hand? Okay. Um, I know she's had some discussions, but we as a council haven't had any discussions. So Ms. Ober, did you want to? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. We actually did talk about this briefly when we were talking about the new behavioral health person um, because these funds are usable for that position. And so when we hired that individual, it was before the funds had come through. Those funds have now come through, but we've put it into the line item associated with our, our behavioral health staff person. Um, and it will not be enough to even cover a third of his time. So it's more just a heads up to council that that's where the funds have gone, at least today, unless you decide to change them to somewhere else. Great, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't have- Do we have an amount of what that is? Yeah, over the 18 years, I believe it's something like $600,000, but it is over 18 years. Um, and so I believe the first year it's something like twenty four or twenty five thousand dollars that the city is receiving. Um, a lot of the cities that we're working with on the behavioral health positions are also looking at investing into a software package that will allow for them to do case management across departments. Uh, we run into not I, I personally, no one other than Glenn can access his his casework. Um, within the city, no one is qualified or certified to be able to do so. So we have to have a unique um, software package that allows for him to communicate with other social workers um, around clinical social workers around the services that we're providing. And so this would allow uh, for Lake Oswego, uh, Oregon City, can be some of these other cities to also talk. Um, there hasn't been any decision about whether or not additional funds should go towards that because we've been placing all of our funds into the actual position. Um, but those that's where some of the other cities are placing their cash. Um, you, you said your jam was prevention. What's, what is the cutting edge or what is been proven successful in prevention strategies? We have a lot of them. We just don't have any money, frankly. And it, prevention is always thought of as, oh, we're going to do it later. And it then later comes, and then it's even it's even worse. And so uh, one of my coworkers is actually going to Rex Putnam um, high, high School, I think, next week, uh, working with the uh, health teacher to do some curriculum around that. It's just we have lots of great, you know, curriculum. We've got this brain about, we've got all these great things. We just need the funding to actually implement them. And we have our prevention coalition, who's got a lot of great partners that are working together. It's just, again, it's hard to lift up these, these strategies. Uh, like I've been going out to cannabis retailers, encouraging them to, you know, have uh, their parents lock up their cannabis to keep it secure from their, from their kids and keep kids from using. It's just, but one person, small amount of time, you know, we've got mm -hmm. these great strategies and evidence-based practices. We just frankly don't have the money to, to implement to do them. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that too, when looking at sort of the underlying factors of what caused people to use substances in the first place, um, it often goes back to trauma, adverse childhood events, things like that way upstream that you, you need to start with some of the prevention work at very, very young ages. I mean, even before middle school, high school years, they, before you have the time to get to the curriculum, some of those uh, protective factors have to take place. So one of our key partners at, C at CFCC is the Northwest Family Services. And so we contract them out to do these after school programs and lots of great things. I get to go to Photo Voice and see the kids, you know, display. They're, you know, looking at retail stores of how they display tobacco or alcohol and they learn leadership skills. So there's a lot of great, you know, there's a lot of great programming that's actually happening in Milwaukee. We just, we just need to expand it. I have a question. Will that slideshow be made public? I mean, I have a ton of questions, but I don't want to ask them where I can easily just look at your slideshow and Google the questions that I have. Yeah, you can ask us questions after off, offline. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're here absolutely. For. I guess one of the questions I was curious about is um, 
when you cite the numbers, either the national number of the 100,000 or the 86 or whatever it was for Milwaukee la or for Clackamas County last year, like what's roughly the breakdown between people who are under or over age 18? Yeah, good question. And I would have included that tonight, but we were sort of limited on time. Um, but I usually do like to show demographic information where we have it. Um, what I will say is that our, our fatalities for people under 18 are very low, mm -hmm. um, among the lowest. Uh, the groups that face the highest death rates are the 30 and 40 year olds. Mm -hmm. Now, when looking at the 911 data that I showed you, that's a little bit different. I would say for the non-fatal overdose or encounters where people are calling in for a drug related event, that is absolutely skewing towards the younger age groups. Um, one for unintentional overdose, non-fatal, but also more of what we're seeing is intentional overdose, so suicide attempts, and those are involving um, more than not prescription drugs, not so much illicit. But it is one of the things that we've been seeing so much more that we've actually created a dashboard just for that. Um, and we have a suicide prevention coordinator at the county that that falls more into her bucket of work, but um, that's sort of what we're seeing when it comes to age breakdown. Wow. Yeah, and, and just I just was looking at my notes of a, a statistic that 50% um, of all people with substance use disorders start their substance use before age 14. So that's again why wow. the focus on, on prevention. I have a question. Oh, yes. So um, it, it's interesting that um, when you mentioned a lot of the cities are um, saying they're going to outsource it to you. And that was the first thing that came to my mind. We, you know, are fortunate enough we have a behavioral health person uh, that will help us, you know, use some of those funds to good effect. But I mean, cities don't have a public health department. And so the county is the public health department. I mean, do you folks have the capacity to manage these multi million dollar? whatever you want to call them, windfalls? It's interesting that you ask that question because part of the policy session is we're going to ask for some staffing to support this. So, you know, things need to be operationalized, which I think is what you're, <laughs> what you're getting at. And so we've, we're hoping that that will happen. And I would say the reality of about those six or seven cities is probably only two, two or maybe three. And they're getting fairly small amounts of funding over the 18 years. So it will be a lift, but probably not as big of a lift as it may seem like. <laughs> yes. I just, you know, it's a, you know, it's kind of a once in a generation, you know, opportunity here. I, sh I shouldn't call it an opportunity when, you know, the, these companies and these did these dastardly things, but um, you know, it's a, it's, it, it, it's an opportunity to right some wrongs, I guess. And I, I, uh, I, I always worry about a lot of money coming in to an infrastructure that is not used to having those kinds of resources. And I'm, I'm just always concerned that it's used efficiently and wisely. And, and, and that's why we've spent all this time developing this, this framework that's sure. guided by a national model and not reinventing the wheel. That's, that's the part that, you know, we, we do sometimes. It's like, I, I let's not to, reinvent the wheel. Let's yeah, I want us to be successful, but it's <laughs> yeah. just, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still a daunting task. And, and I, I do have one other question. It was like, Oregon is number one in uh, drug, mm -hmm. well, I, I forgot the category. Number one, is that, I mean, we're, was that number per two, capita? Or, number two. Is that per capita no. or is that number one by every state of all the states? Uh, was it? I think nationally you're talking about substance use disorders. Yeah, use yeah, yeah. All substance use disorders. Yeah. I think by state, yes. I know, but is that a raw number? Or is that a per capita number? I believe raw number because it's self-report data. But I can we'll double check that. I mean, we're not that populous a state. I mean, we're right in the right. middle. You no, know, so it's probably a per capita. Well, yeah. Yeah, I'll d we'll double check that for you. Yeah, I would think it'd be per capita. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, not, not, not number. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, that would be pretty significant. Yeah, it was alarming to see. <laughs> it's alarming either way. Yeah, I agree. Um, can we talk about naloxone for a minute? Uh, this weekend, there was this, or last Friday or whatever, there was this announcement that FDA made it available over the counter. Um, 
I had gone to the pharmacy here in Milwaukee a couple months ago and gotten a prescription because I had somebody I knew had had to you know, administer it to someone at a bus stop. And I thought, I don't want to be in that situation. So I have a prescription that I carry around in my car. Um, it didn't cost me anything. But now what the, some of the reporting I heard this weekend is that now that it's non prescription, it's going to start costing people more. Um, is, is distribution of doses something you guys are thinking about? Is it something we should be thinking about? Um, it has become a significant part of my job over the last couple of years. Yes. So out of the public health division, we actually have a naloxone distribution program. Mm -hmm. But um, she just drops them off before she came here. <laughs> and I, have I made a stop at City Auto <laughs> Wholesale who had requested some kits. Mm -hmm. um, we are somewhat limited on supply, though. So we have to be um, have pretty strict criteria on we, who we give it to. We want to make sure it's getting to the most at-risk populations. Um, but what I would say about the prescription, you must have received as a third party under your insurance, and it may have just been that your insurance is really good and covers it. Um, but moving forward, yes, if people just want to go in and buy it off of a grocery store shelf or they're going to have to pay out of pocket for it unless they can find a place to access it similar to now. Um, there are quite a few places where you can get it. We got a very generous donation from Care Oregon. Um, the three Tri-County Health Departments did, and so we're doing our best to get it out. But we are very much at the mercy of funding and um, grants and that sort of thing. Okay. Other questions? Um, sorry, did you? Go ahead. You've been waiting. No, go but ahead. I've done already, so <laughs> chance. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll come back. <laughs> okay. I have three questions, um, and let me preface this by saying that each one of them probably warrants a follow-up meeting, so I'm just going to go through them. F don't feel like you need to respond at length. I'm sure that I'll be calling and catching up with you after this. Um, the first question has to do with data. Uh, I'm wondering if the calls for service can be normalized by population for each of the cities or if they're just compared by, you know, the, the raw number. and. Um, and I'm also like race, ethnic. Uh, no, I get what I'm wondering is, you know, Milwaukee has a greater population than, you know, some of the other jurisdictions in the county or in, so I know we're looking at just the, the calls for service. I'm also wondering, um, you know, what that rate the looked rate. like yeah. by population. Um, and then to get to the, the piece there around, I'm, I've used something in the past called a relative rate index to look at disaggregated data for race and ethnicity. And I found that that's really helpful to start looking at comparing um, calls um, or, you know, in this case calls. So I'm, I'm wondering if we might be able to follow up um, and dig into the data a little bit more so we can get an idea of how it reflects disaggregated populations. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the rate, we can probably absolutely get the rate for you. When it comes to the demographic information, we are we are um, dependent on what the paramedics put into the reports. Okay. Um, sometimes they will list like race and ethnicity data as an example, but sometimes they don't. And then it's really just their their opinion on what they think, you know, the race or ethnicity of the person is. So it's not accurate at all. Okay. So we are very hesitant to collect that information just because it's not a fair representation. Yeah, it's not reflective. Okay. All right. That's really helpful. Um, second question goes to um, some of those adverse childhood experiences and moving upstream and really kind of looking at early childhood. Um, I don't know if Clackamas County employs um, community health workers uh, through public health, but there's a certification program statewide for those for those folks, and you can add on certain elements of certification. So I'm wondering if some of the funding might be able to be used for prevention specialist certification, because with community health workers, they're, they can be going into homes and doing home visits. You can build Medicaid and OHP, and you have a lot more flexibility to draw the funding out a little bit longer. Um, so I'm wondering if layering on that additional prevention specialist training would allow them to have that, um, you know, that additional lens to look for some of the underlying factors around opioids. Yeah, yeah we, um, we actually, my coworker, who you might know, he actually got 
SAPS training, for, which is helps for prevention specialists, and that's happening in June. We were able to connect. Again, this is kind of goes to the lack of resources to the, yeah. um, the what is it called, the Training Technical Institute. So University of Washington has like pretty big curriculum and, and body of work around um, prevention. And so they're going to come down for free and uh, do that training. So that would be open to That's all great. different community members. And I just have to tell you that um, I'm helping uh, Toto Suto apply for a drug free communities grant awesome. for CanB. And I saw your name when I was digging through the box <laughs> <Awesome. laughs> from like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to say that was well, kind of coincidental. But that might be <laughs> something to talk to the state of Oregon about, yes. because in that in the Wayback Machine, that's what the state paid for was a cohort of people from all over the state, from every county, who were trained prevention specialists who th could then help build out local programs. Yeah, um, yeah and that's another, that one of the findings from, from this session, it's a, like, I think there was, so there's, the need is like 90 prevention specialists in Clackamas County, we have three, and I'm, I can tell you the other, <laughs> the yeah. other two, and so, yeah, there's, you brought up a, very great thing. suggestion now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Um, last question, and this one definitely will have to follow up outside the meeting, but I'm really interested in the commingling of these funds with SHS funds, yeah. the supportive housing services money. That's a much larger pool. There's yeah. there's a reason that, you know, there's rationale around social determinants of health to make a case for these funds to be used together. And I hope that your board sees that. And it's already happening. Okay, I'll good. just say that, and we can definitely follow up, and I'll give you some specific examples of, I think, even in here in Milwaukee, we have some conversations, I think, Perfect. underway that would blend those dollars. Yes. Thank you so much. This is really great, and it's good to see you again. Yeah, great to see you. Thank you, everybody, for asking oh, such sorry, nice... I, no, I just I, wanted to thank oh, you yeah. for your questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I mean, obviously, it's very um, disturbing and, and disheartening to see that Milwaukee is, you know, the highest in, in terms of the calls. Uh, and, you know, to touch on Mayor Beatty and, and Councillor uh, Stavengeord's request on the data, that I'd like to know the, the demographics on the calls too, like how much are youth and then and pregnant women, if any of those calls have been or are pregnant women. Um, so, I, you know, it would be great to have more of that info. And then also on the other, on the other side, so if I'm understanding this correctly, these are the strategies that they provided for cities to to do based on the funds they're getting from the settlement. It, but, there's guardrails in place. So the tobacco, I worked in tobacco prevention and that went sideways. And so uh, there's providing guardrails so that cities, municipalities have to spend it on these evidence-based strategies. So within that, you know, all those different exhibit E that outlines like what your city can do with, with those funds. And, and this is where I'm, it kind of doesn't, makes sense to have this all these strategies but have such a small budget over 18 years especially when you're the highest in the region right or in the clackamas county to, to tackle this because now it's based on the amount that we get it's more like what can you fit in that budget as opposed to what's going to be the most effective yeah there is a much more extensive list in exhibit e which we also sent as an yeah. attachment so it's, maybe uh, reference yeah. that because the uh, behavioral health co-responder position that um ann ober mentioned falls within that. The nine that we pulled up were just the core most evidence-based, kind of backed by public health research at Johns Hopkins, um, and probably the more, um, the things that you see happening more often in, in recent years, but it goes beyond that, the ways that you can use the funding. There's pages of it. We just tried to put right. <laughs> it down. I'm just saying that your limit, it's not really what you want to do or what's the most effective. It's basically what's gonna, what you can afford. Sort of, yes. Right. Yes. So, and, and if, if, I mean, for, for Milwaukee, I would think that prevention, considering there's so much, that we have so much such high calls, would be a, a key. I mean, that would probably be the most important thing for us to focus on. But with that limited budget, I mean, how, how effective are we going to be? Right. And just know, too, um, one of the reasons we're here to share the county framework is because that also includes additional work in Milwaukee. So, you know, we're hoping to do many of those strategies that we showed you in Milwaukee that would hopefully complement the way that you choose to use your city funds. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I we're here to provide technical question. assistance if you, you know, if you would like to have some to help you with that implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just not, not just trying to clarify just that, you know, it, it 
Funding, 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 funding. <laughs> That's the key. Money, money, money. And, yep. Uh, there's so many great things on here. But it's not so much as what we want to do, just so much as what we're able to do. And it just right. sucks because it's like we're facing a crisis. Yeah, um, absolutely. And when many... it comes to youth substance use prevention, I mean, basically, it's the lack of mental health resources. It's huge. I mean, there's no treatment. There's there's no the, the kids. My kid was, you know, homeschooled during the pandemic by me and trying to work at the same time. And so we've got a lot of those kids that are that are suffering and acting, acting out and need a lot of support. <laughs> And quite honestly, the the county amount, the 13.7, will just barely scratch the surface no, on the exactly. need. It's yeah. not, that's what I'm saying. It's like, when you break it down, it's like, I was thinking we would get more because of the number of calls that we get in Milwaukee, right? But that apparently, I mean, the public I was shocked health, at the amount. Yeah, the public health metrics I mentioned, they're very complicated. I had to dig and really ask for them. Um, and they were really hard to come across and they're hard to understand. It's not based on anything like, you know, Logical. necessarily just fatalities or calls, that sort of thing. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I know, I know the Glenn who you're investing the money in, he's, he's awesome. So I support, <laughs> I support that investment. Yes, everybody's <laughs> jealous of, <laughs> of the chief for having snagged him. Yes, yes. Any last questions for the ladies? All right. Well, we appreciate you coming. It's a Thank you important so much, really topic. Much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Community comments. This is the part of the agenda during which council will hear community member comments regarding city business. Uh, for those in person who wish to speak, please submit a yellow comment card like these found on the table just outside the door. If you are on Zoom, please use the raise hand reaction to alert staff that you wish to speak. And when instructed to begin, click the microphone option to unmute yourself. If you are calling in by a telephone through Zoom and would like to make a comment, dial star nine to raise your hand. You may also submit a comment via email to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. Before you make your comments, please state your name and city of residence for the record. If you would like the city to follow up with you, please submit your comment information to OCR at MilwaukeeOregon.gov. As council has other business items on the agenda this evening, speaker, speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Because information provided during community comments may be new, the city manager will respond at the next council meeting to those comments that require follow-up. Before we begin, is there follow-up from the March 21st community comments, City Manager Ober? No, but I did actually just want to bring up, there had been a comment the meeting prior about the um, parking lot issue, and JCB staff have been working with the constituent on that for the last couple of weeks, um, and I do think we're finding some resolution. So I just wanted to give you an update that we are continuing to work on that issue, and we did not receive any new updates at the last meeting. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, I have one community comment here, and are you seeing any online? No. Okay, uh, Philip Moen. And we'll give you three minutes. Five, three minutes. I, I'm Philip Moen in Milwaukee. Um, and regarding the uh, drug thing, my dad was a chemist, and he taught us kids two things all chemicals are poisonous and it's impossible to prove any chemical is safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I'd like to com I compliment the street crews for their fine job of the snow removal this past snow day, unlike Portland. Um, back in the Midwest, they have, the main roads have a sign, emergency snow route. And if you get stuck on the emergency snow route without chains or studded tires or anything, you get towed and fined. So people don't usually get stuck on those roads, unlike Portland. Um, second of all, uh, the safety team, is it like traffic only or what, what, what's the safety team do? Is it? There's a public safety advisory committee, right, if that's, that's what, what you're referring about. to, that every neighborhood has a representative on. It meets 
monthly or most months anyway uh, with the engineering department on various public, it has a lot of things in their portfolio. Is it mostly like traffic, traffic safety or is it crime safety or? Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not the best person to answer that question. Uh, uh, you should just make whatever comments you want to make about it. Oh, and well, let's, okay. No, let's let him go. I can answer at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's our process. We take the questions and we answer at the next meeting. Okay. But that's also, um, if you're oh, interested well, in your you public. Know, I made a proposal to a state representative one time, mm -hmm. um, since my niece was living in an apartment that didn't even have a deadbolt on the door and her landlord wouldn't put one on, is what, what does a city think about passing a code like everybody has one year to put a deadbolt on all their doors to reduce crime? It, it was, would anyone even think of something like that? Something, it's really something they should do anyway without, you know, right. or what right. if you just suggested that everyone have a deadbolt on all their outside doors? I suspect our police chief would suggest that. <laughs> um, I would suggest that. But um, having a code that, you know, then becomes an enforcement issue for the city is, is a little bit of a well, different it would, thing. It would be like, okay, if the police come to your house for some reason and say, oh, you don't have a deadbolt on your door, you know, not like... <laughs> paying someone to go around, oh, he doesn't have a dead bone on his door or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would encourage you to, it, from your address, I can't, I'm not sure whether you're in historic Milwaukee or Lake Road. It's between Harrison and King Road. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are in Ardenwald neighborhood. Sorry. Um, get involved in your neighborhood association. That's the place to take these kind of questions, really. Yeah. And get, if your neighborhood shares your passion for some of these issues and they make a suggestion as a neighborhood association, that's going to uh, reverberate louder. So I would encourage you to go to your neighborhood association meeting. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Ms. Ober, was there something you wanted to add? No, I guess. Oh. No? Okay. No, there wasn't. I um I wanted to tell him he could call me if he'd like to just give me a ring after uh, tomorrow. Um, and Scott Stafford can give him my number. Okay. All right. No other public comments, Mr. Stauffer? Okay. Uh and I'll move on to the consent agenda. Tonight's consent agenda includes minutes of the City Council February 14th, 2023 study session, February 21st, 2023 work session, and February 21st, 2023 regular session. A resolution authorizing an engineering services contract with Kittleson and Associates for a not to exceed amount of $943,210 for the King Road Improvements Project. File number CIP 2022-A15. A resolution authorizing an application for a Metro Nature and Neighborhoods grant for the Scott, Bowman Bray and Balfour Parks projects a resolution acting as the local contract review board authorizing the purchase of replacement network equipment, a resolution authorizing the purchase of a 2023 Ford F550 service body truck. Does any member of council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. A second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Hearing none, consent agenda is approved unanimously. And we will move on to annexations. We have two of them tonight. Uh, the annexation of 8909 Southeast 55th Avenue, file number a 2023-001, presented by senior planner Brett Kelver, and I guess they're tag teaming, associate planner Adam Hiru is on Zoom. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors, Brett Kelver, senior planner with the city. 
and we're doing a little bit of a special intro to annexations presentation tonight. Um, new council, these are our first annexations of the year. So um, for you and anyone in the public who, who hasn't tuned in before to an annexation, uh, this isn't our normal uh, presentation that we would make. I think you usually have a lot of things to do. Most of these annexations are, are fairly straightforward and almost just uh, matters of paperwork in the process. Uh, so normally, I, I think the previous councils have asked if there were ways that we could further expedite the process. <laughs> Um, and we have done what we could uh, to do that. Tonight, though, we want to just take a few extra minutes and just go through the basics. So, so this is a little, little bit of a special presentation. And just for starters, the basic idea, annexation is the way that we change the city limits. We make the city a little bit bigger by um, pulling in additional properties. Um, there are a lot of different, different ways to do it, um, but the way, the way that it works, basically you cannot annex unless you're somehow contiguous to our existing city limit, well, whether it's by right of way that's already in our city limit or a property, maybe your neighbor's in the city and you're, you're not, but there has to be some, you have to be touching the city, city limit in general to, to be able to come in. Um, and there are, you know, we have some comprehensive plan policies and there are some metro and state rules that, that we follow for that, but that's the basic idea is that um, annexation is the way the city gets just a little bit bigger. Um, it is a requirement in most all cases that you be annexed into the city to take advantage of or use, connect to our services, especially our water system, our sewer system. That's what avail you, avails you of um, um, our code compliance, you know, police, that kind of thing. So that's the basic, that's the basic idea with annexation, what it is. Um, the most common type of annexation that comes before the, the council, the one that we've dealt with the most over the last 10 to 12 years is what's called an expedited annexation. And the basic principles there are, um, it's able to be expedited a little bit because you have full agreement of all the property owners who might be involved. It's usually just one, you know, we are often bringing you one property at a time. Um, and the, uh, the way it moves a little faster too is you're agreeing to come into the city and we have some, some tables set up that whatever your zoning and comprehensive plan designation were in, this, in the county, we have a way to translate them directly into uh, a, a certain city standard. And when you're doing expedited annexation, you're not proposing to change from a, um, a residential use in the county to a manufacturing use in the city, uh, at least not in the expedited way. There's a process for doing that. It's non-expedited and it involves, you know, looking at our changes to our comprehensive plan map, zoning map, that kind of thing. So um, the way the expedited annexations work, they, they don't require a public hearing. We do come to you and you are adopting an ordinance every time you are annexing a property, but there's no, it's not uh, the same as kind of a, a public hearing where there's public testimony and comment and deliberation, that, that kind of thing, quite the same way. We are required to provide notice to all the, the districts that are out there that uh, receive some, some tax. So the Clackamas Fire District, uh, there's a street light district, um, the parks district, all those, all those entities get notice that the, that the property is moving from being unincorporated into, into the city. It does change people's taxing status a little bit. And part of the process, what takes the most time is um, just going through all the steps of notifying all the parties that need to be notified. We do provide notice to people within 400 feet of each of these properties um, at least 20 days before the annexation. And then from tonight, it will still take several weeks before you know, we send notice to the Department of Revenue, uh, we send notice to Metro, and finally, when the Secretary of State's office files of the annexation, it's all complete. And from that point forward, people would come into our building department to get a building permit for work they wanna do. They would contact our code compliance um, staff if they had a code issue. So all of that to say, um, that's how the expedited process works. The properties that are coming for annexation tonight are, are in an area that we call the, the NISI area, the Northeast Sewer Extension Area. And this is a project that started uh, 12 or so years ago uh, and had its origins, I think, a little bit farther back than that. But this is an area in the northeast portion of the city. I've circled it here in red. And, you know, as you can see, it's, it's a lot of properties that are relatively near a portion of Johnson Creek that hadn't been, um, that aren't incorporated. And a lot of them are operating on septic systems. And so um, the city coordinated and got a community development block grant at some point to help with the installation of a system and help people be able to afford to connect to it. So 
over many years, we, we kind of got the funding lined up. And then in uh, 2010, we started by annexing the rights of way in the streets there. So everyone would have a, a way to be contiguous to the city. Um, and then the city um, worked with the contractor to construct sewer, put sewer lines in all these streets and the rights of way that we had annexed. And then we actually, over a couple of years, did um, we helped people by doing batch annexations. We did 25 or 30 properties at a time where we tried to make it as easy as possible for people to just provide the paperwork, staff would do the rest. And we, we were able to bring big batches at a time to council so people could could annex in mass cut the fee to do that right yeah the, and we did some financial incentives right the money the to. money was set up there was a i think it was a basically 10 over 10 years money was available for people to pay to help pay down their share of of the new system the the way it works is um, I don't know ex all the exact details, but based on like the size and maybe development potential of your property, every property was assigned a, a dollar figure, a share for their the cost of the overall system. And, and we track that. And the way the incentive program worked was uh, early in the program, the first year of the program, there was a really generous discount. So um, even just to just to help pay your share you didn't even necessarily have to annex but just if you helped if you pay your share you got a big break that discount got a little bit smaller every year and that's been part why we we try to facilitate bringing people in in mass in the early port portion of that program um, but yes those those incentives finally expired I think a couple of years ago and so now um, now people are still tracking the shares that people owe but there's no there's no more financial help for that um, some of the more of the details are there are about um, a total of about 260 properties um, that are in this this Nisi area. The ones in red are the ones that still have not annexed. Um, there's about 90 or so properties <clears throat> that are still out there. And again, uh, I guess you you could pay this your share of the new system and not have to annex. You could annex and not connect to the sewer, but you can't connect to the sewer without annexing. So that's the arrangement. And the way the way these properties and these annexations have worked over time is that usually a, the common scenario is one of two things. One, my septic tank has failed and the arrangement we have with the county is when that happens, the county will not issue a permit for a new septic system. It's time to come into the city and connect. Um, also, what we see sometimes is someone selling a property and the buyer doesn't want to buy a property that's not connected to the sewer. So that's also kind of an occasion that will drive people to um, to annex and, and make the connection. So I guess with that, um, I'll ask if you have any questions about annexation in general or about this particular area, and which is, which is again, like I say, is it's not the only place we've seen annexations over the years, but that's the one that's most common that we bring to you. So does the county, as a matter of routine, not um, give out new permits within certain geographic boundaries? It, whether they be city or not. I mean, what's their, do they just not do it? Well, I don't know that I can speak more broadly to that. I know that we do have an agreement with the county for this particular area okay. where we've coordinated and said, if you're in this geographical area and the and you have a problem with your septic system, the county has agreed they will not issue a permit for a replacement of the septic system. It's time to, to annex to, this, to the city. Okay, yeah. So th in, in that particular case, the county is basically not issuing permits within the Nisi area. Right. The, the, technically, there are times when they will do that. And that's uh, the emerge. There are sometimes emergency situations where, uh, again, because the overall annexation process does take a couple months to get all the paperwork done, but your system is failing right now. Right. You need to connect to the sewer system right now. So we, we can make an arrangement with someone where if they pay, the system development charges that they owe, if they pay their share of the, the NISI fee, we um, and they, they submit their annexation forms to get the process going. Uh, we have an uh, agreement and a practice that we will uh, we will sign up basically a, a, a form that they would take to the county and say, everyone knows what's happening here. They've started the process for annexation. County, please issue a permit to connect to the city sewer while we finish the annexation process. So. Thank you. And I will say there, I don't know, um, the state has some rules and the county maybe too about 
uh, th th there's definitely discouraging septics near creeks. Yeah. So the closer you are, like a lot of this is close to Johnson Creek, right? The nearer you are to creeks, the more disfavored having septic is. I know that. Right. The water table's really high. It's better just to get it into, into a system where we can manage it. Right. 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 Okay. Other questions? No? no questions? Okay. All right. Well, with that in mind, I've got one slide showing the two properties, and I, we have to go through them separately, I guess, because each one has its own ordinance. Um, but the, the first property that is on the slate for annexation is 8909 Southeast 55th Avenue. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about any of the information that was um, provided. I just have a comment, which is I noticed that the form that the owner filled out said Portland as her address and said um, a zip code that wasn't 97222. And so I looked up the zip code map and indeed that is not 97222. There's a dip down of whatever it is, 97206 or something that Correct. dips down south of Johnson Creek Boulevard. Right. And so there's a chunk there that is not our normal zip code. Right. You're, you're correct. Our the, the JCB office has that zip code. Oh, does right. it? Okay. I think we still okay. put Milwaukee on our business cards. But I, if you do a search for the zip code, I think it shows up as a Portland address. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, any questions? No? Okay. So I think, is it ordinance time? Does someone read the... Okay, okay so but we, we're going to go through them... Yeah, just one by one. One by one. Right. Okay. So uh, I will entertain a motion on the 55th Avenue project, which is on page six of our script. If someone would like to make the motion. I move for the first and second readings by title only an adoption of the ordinance annexing a tract of land identified as tax lot 1S2E30AB06500 and located at 8909 Southeast 55th Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee, file number A-2023-001. I second. It has been moved and seconded for the first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance annexing attractive land identified as tax lot 1S2E30AB06500 and located at 8909 Southeast 55th Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee. File number A-2023-001. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. None heard. The annexation passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Recorder, will you read the ordinance two times by title only, please? Absolutely, Ms. Uh, Madam Mayor. An ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, annexing a tract of land identified as mm, tax lot 1S2E30AB06500 and located at 8909 Southeast 55th Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee, file number A-2023-001. And again, an ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, annexing a tract of land identified as tax lot 1S2E30AB06500 and located at 8909 Southeast 55th Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee, file number A-2023-001. And would you please poll the council? Council President Nicodemus. Aye. Councilor Stavenyard. Aye. Councilor Cosmerbody. Aye. Councilor Massey. Aye. Mayor Beatty. Aye. Motion carried five to zero, ordinance 2227. Okay. And now I would entertain a motion regarding the Stanley Avenue property. Oh, I move for the first and second readings by title only <clears throat> and the and adoption of the ordinance annexing a tract of land identified as tax lot 1S2E30 AC00700 and located at 9351 Southeast Stanley Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee. File number A-2023-001. 
2023-002. I second. It's been moved and seconded for the first and second readings by title only and adoption of the ordinance annexing attractive land identified as tax lot 1S2E 30AC00700 and located at 9351 Southeast Stanley Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee, file number A2023-002. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. None heard. The annexation passes unanimously. Mr. Stopper, would you please read the ordinance two times by title only? An ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, annexing a tract of land identified as tax lot 1S2E30AC00700 and located at 9351 Southeast Stanley Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee, file number A2023-002. And again, <clears throat> an ordinance of the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, annexing a tract of land identified as tax lot 1S2E30AC00700 and located at 9351 Southeast Stanley Avenue into the city limits of the city of Milwaukee, file number A-2023-002. And would you please poll the council? Council President Nicodemus. Aye. Councilor Stavon Nierard. Aye. Uh, Councilor Cosgrove, body. Aye. Councilor Massey. Aye. Mayor Beatty. Aye. Motion passed five to zero. Ordinance two 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 eight. Great. Thank you. I'll just say in parting that unless you prefer otherwise, we we had moved to a point where we would have the staff person here to make a very short presentation, but we would we'd even stop doing PowerPoint just to try to help move it along. So if you decide you want something different, you can let us know. But. Probably no slideshow. <laughs> In the Just future. a little jazz hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to Milwaukee. Those two new residents or multiple more than maybe more than two, but the people in those two new two homes. Um, all right. I will invite uh, Police Chief Luke Strait to give us uh, the annual update on Oregon Criminal Justice Commission stops data. Yes. Well, we got to share it through our Zoom. Did you say go ahead and start, Scott? Go ahead and start. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry about Good evening, Mayor Beatty, counselors, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Luke Strait. I'm the chief of police for the city of Milwaukee. And I'm here primarily just to introduce uh, Kelly Officer. She's the research director for the Criminal Justice Commission. And she's going to explain the uh, STOP, statistical transparency of policing uh, program for the state of Oregon, and then specific data related to the city of Milwaukee. Kelly? Can I ask when you are born with a name like officer, you kind of narrow your uh, <laughs> your career choices or? It is, yeah. it is pure coincidence uh, that my last name is officer and actually married into that one. So oh, I okay. had, a, had an option to, okay. uh, to avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, and it does create a little confusion every, every now and again, but I am a statistician by training um, and uh, have never have never worked in any law enforcement or, or any kind of other, any other kind of field, so. She's too smart. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't, we wouldn't take her. <laughs> officer, officer. Yeah, officer, officer, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That should be good. Okay, great. All right. Okay, if I can get this PowerPoint to work, um, I have a I have a presentation prepared for you all today. Uh, as as the chief said, to get a, give an overview of our analysis this year um, of the traffic stop data for the Milwaukee Police Department. Uh, so to kind of get everybody on the same page, uh, in 2017, the Oregon Legislature passed House Bill 2355. So this required all law enforcement agencies across the state to uh, provide their traffic and pedestrian stop data to the Criminal Justice Commission, the, the state agency that I work for. Uh, so this, is, this has been in place for a couple years now. We've worked out some of the kinks along the way. Um, here we have listed all the data elements that are required to be submitted by all the agencies. It's, it's a lot of this is what you would expect. Um, information about the stop, um, information about the outcome of the stop. Was there a citation, search, or arrest? Uh, the reason for the stop. Um, we have here the perceived race ethnicity of the person who was stopped. Um, and so that is that is the what the officer perceives that person's race or ethnicity to be, um, which may be different than what they self-identify as. Um, the officers are required to enter that information. Unknown is not an option. Um, and so it really is the perceived information. Um, the age and gender could also be perceived, but you know a lot of that's on the driver's license. So a lot of times they will have a have a verifiable source for that information. Um, also, uh, we have all this data at the agency level. Uh, we do not have any information about the specific officers that made the stop. We're not allowed to have that information. And then outside of the demographics of the person who is stopped, um, we're not allowed to have any of the identifying in information of the stopped individual. Uh, so this, this is really all of the, we do some pretty complex analysis, but it's limited to everything that we have in the information from these data elements. Um, we, you know, we've received some feedback of, hey, the, um, the type of vehicle that the person is driving would be really helpful. You guys should collect that. Um, it would be quite a challenge to add that into the into the, the the process of doing that. So we do not have we do not have that information. Um, and so that kind of gives gives some background on the on the data that's submitted to the state. Uh, we do an annual report that comes out December one each year, and we do the analysis for all law enforcement agencies in the state. Um, for some smaller agencies, we're not able to do the the full models. Um, we don't have enough data, um, and so we'll walk you through the results for the Milwaukee Police Department uh, this evening. Um, so before we get into the data, uh, just some background on the. Um, statistical approaches that we're doing. We do uh, three different statistical analyses. They're each fairly complex in, in their own way and each answering a slightly different research question. Uh, we're doing multivariate statistics where possible and trying to provide a holistic view um, of the decision to stop and the stop outcomes from, from this information. We are not doing benchmarks um, or a comparison to the residential populations. A lot of times you'll see you know, perhaps other organizations talk about this is the racial breakdown of the residential population of a city, and then here's the racial breakdown of individuals stopped, and then just kind of compare those percentages and say what's higher, what's lower. Um, that can give some kind of overall co context information. It doesn't really tell us much about um, disparities within officers' decisions or tell us what what could really be done about that. Um, if you think about the city of Milwaukee, I imagine a lot of folks drive through Milwaukee that don't live in Milwaukee. Right. And so that, that comparison is, is going to lead to a lot of questions that, that aren't going to be too helpful for, for Chief Strait to dig into and think about how, how to address that information. Um, I will also say too, you know, we're looking at aggregate data that the law enforcement agencies provide to us and we are analyzing that data for trends of racial disparities um, within that information. And so this, this doesn't say anything about an individual's experience interacting with an officer and whether that individual was treated fairly. This is really looking at aggregate data trends for what we see for the, for the stop data or the city. Okay, and with that, we'll jump into uh, the, the three analyses. They, they are fairly com complex, so feel free to, to stop me or <laughs> have me explain things, something that didn't quite make sense. Um, so the first is what we call the stop outcomes test. So looking at the traffic stop data, we're looking at the outcome of citation, search, or arrest. And are we seeing differences across racial groups in those outcomes of the stop? Um, another way to put this is holding, other factors constant, 
um, do we see disparities in citation rates, search rates, or arrest rates? Uh, so we are doing um, a, a complicated statistical model that uses propensity score matching, but that is balancing across the different factors of what we have in the data. So after we have balanced across differences for the age of the driver, um, the gender of the driver, the reason for the stop, the time of day, the day of week, after we have balanced across that information, are we seeing differences in these citation search, citation rates, search rates, or arrest rates? So for the city of Milwaukee, we were able to do this analysis for the, for the uh, four racial groups that are listed here in this tab table, uh, Asian, Black, Latinx, and Middle Eastern drivers. And then we do this across the three outcomes, citation, search, or arrest. So we are actually doing 12 different statistical models in comparing this information. And in this year's uh, report for the city of Milwaukee, we did not find any significant differences in these outcomes. Um, so I'll go into more detail there, but we, we did not find any differences in this test that was done for Milwaukee. Uh, thinking about um, our annual report has results for all agencies across the state. And when we, when we do that, really the, the most common outcome that we find for a lot of agencies is a difference in citation rates for Latinx drivers. Um, so for, for a lot of communities in Oregon, the largest non-white group is Hispanic or Latinx. Um, and the most common adverse outcome of a traffic stop is a citation. Um, and so across the state, that really is is the um, most common disparity Although, that we see. Isn't an arrest more adverse than a citation? You said the most adverse oh, the, I'm outcome sorry, was sorry, a I'm sorry. The mo citation? The most, the most common okay. adverse outcome. So okay. thinking about okay. if the driver receives a warning or if the driver receives nothing, we'll think of that as not an punishment oriented outcome <laughs> where a citation or an arrest is a citation at least will usually result in a fine perhaps perhaps if you're a first time driver you might you might get a, a small fine um, but there you know there is that issuing of the citation has has occurred so the officer made the decision to issue the citation um, in that in that stop um, oh I'll provide a little, little more data here. So this is looking just at the citation results and we did not find differences in those, in those citation rates. So looking here at Asian drivers at the top of the table, if the citation patterns for Asian drivers were the same as what we observed for white dri drivers that are stopped by Milwaukee Police Department, we would expect that citation rate to be about 22.7%. And you can see that it was actually 18.6%. So it was a little bit lower. Um, so not, not, in, not showing a disparity there. Now, if we look at that for Latinx drivers, we see that one is higher. The actual citation rate was 26.4 compared to the 23.9. So it is higher. But when we're doing the statistical model, we're looking at the variation that we're seeing in the data. This difference here, we would expect to see by chance, given the variation that we see in the stop reasons, the age and gender of the driver, and those factors that we see there. So were that difference to be higher, then we, we could potentially skip to that statistically significant difference. Um, and as I said, that is the one that we find uh, most commonly across all the, all the law enforcement agencies in Oregon. So I'll pause there and take questions. That was a lot of information to, to provide. So you refer to the predicted as sort of the based on the white dri the white drivers. So why is that not the same percentage right. for each group? Sure. Yes. So we we could just do that simple comparison, right, of white drivers compared to say Latinx drivers. Um, but there are other differences across those groups as well. We see differences in age. We see differences in gender. Um, differences in the reason for the stop. And so after we have accounted for those other factors, then we have what we would expect that citation rate to be. So I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm going to guess the citation rate for white drivers is about 23%. And so we predict for Latinx drivers a little bit higher, tend to be younger, more male drivers that we, that we see in that particular group. Um, and so there is some some slight okay. accounting for the differences across other demographic factors, um, reason for the stop, and that information. And this is all perceived 
race, right? And this is all perceived race, ethnicity of the driver from from what the officers are entering into the system. Um, the training materials do instruct the officers, don't ask the person what their race, ethnicity is. And we, we thinking about the stop analysis, we really want to know the officer is making the decision. So we want to know what the officer perceived the person's race, ethnicity to be, both in the decision to stop the person and then in the decision to write a citation or the decision to arrest. Right. Okay, I'll move on to the next uh, statistical uh, model that we do here. This is specific to stops where a search is conducted. We've seen search rates um, decline over the last couple of years just across the board. Um, and you'll see here at this table, the counts are fairly low for Milwaukee. So here we have, these are the actual number of searches conducted. And then we look at the um, the outcome rate, the, the statistical literature calls it the hit rate, and that feels a little weird to say hit rate. Um, we've, we've Sometimes people call it a successful search, but that also feels strange. Um, I don't know that that was a success. Uh, so, but the rate of finding something, the outcome or the hit rate is, the, is where the decision was made to search the individual and something was found. Um, and so we can see there were 39 searches of white individuals, and then of those 39, and 54% of those contraband was found. Um, and then we have the counts there for the other groups as well. You can see those are quite low. Uh, so we, uh, to do the statistical comparison here, we need at least a count of 30 in each group. So we were not able to actually do this comparison for Milwaukee because the counts are too low with this. Now let's say, let's say that there were 32 Latinx searches and we did get to that required sample size and that that hit rate was low, say it was only 20%. That's the difference that where we would identify the disparity in that it looks like there's perhaps different criteria in the decision to search and that um, the rate of finding things is, is quite a bit different. And so that would be that would be what the test is is searching for. That's what, I mean, the, what the test is <laughs> analyzing is that difference in those rates. Um, so, so low sample sizes here for Milwaukee, but you can see what those look like there. Okay, and then finally, uh, the decision to stop analysis. Um, so this is looking at the officer's decision to stop a driver, and this is uh, based on a test that's done in the statistical literature. It uses a pretty clever comparison of comparing stops made when it is light outside to when it is dark outside, and it narrows that, that window to the inner twilight window. So in the evening time, it's about 4.30 to roughly 8.30 to 9, where in, on January 10th at 5.30, it's light outside. Um, on June 10th, sorry, Backwards. January 10th, it is dark. <laughs> and June 10th, it is light. It's the same time of day, hopefully similar, similar driving patterns. And we can use that variation, that natural variation out the, throughout the course of the year of light to dark to make that comparison. Um, again, this is a multivariate model. So we're also bringing in differences and um, factoring for the age of the driver, the gender of the driver, the reason for the stop, the day of the week, and pulling that information into this model as well. And so if, if the rate of non-white drivers being stopped um, when it is light outside is exactly the same as it is for white drivers compared to darkness, uh, in this table, we would expect the value to be 1.0. Um, so get into stats lingo a little bit here, um, but it's an odds ratio. That's the result of the test. So if those rates are exactly the same, it would be 1.0. Uh, so in our report that was released in uh, December 2021, we did find a disparity for black drivers for Milwaukee PD, and that's the 2.68 in the table that has the asterisks next to it. So that 2.68 was significantly higher than the 1.0, and we did see the difference for, for drivers in that report. Um, in the report that was released in December 2022, uh, we did not have that finding. That odds ratio was 1.11, um, so it was not significant in the most recent report. Uh, for Latinx drivers in the 2021 report, you can see it is higher than one, but it did not get to that statistically significant level. Um, and then in this most recent report, it is it is lower and closer to one. So we can't see the digit on the Latinx 
the first year. Can oh. you tell us what that is? It is 1.58. Okay. Yeah, there oh. we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Scott. Um, now, uh, uh, my, my supervisor, Ken Sanchegrin, and I presented the information from the 2021 report to this group a little over a year ago um, and had some good discussion around that roughly 2.7 finding. And so then this, this provides the update for what we found for this year. So this is a repeat from, from what was about a year ago, but I'm gonna dig into it for a little context here. So in that 2021 report, we did see that black individuals were more likely to be stopped in daylight versus darkness. And it was about 2.7 times higher. That was that um, significant finding. So we did, uh, Chief Strait worked pretty closely with us and really wanted to dig into this and understand What's, what's driving this, what's happening, you know, what time of day, what are we looking at here? Um, and so as you, as you might expect, we have that evening inner twilight window and that morning twilight window. It was pretty much driven by the evening window was the majority of the stops. And that is that, oh, thank you again. That is that bottom right-hand table is that evening uh, window. So you can see there that the, um, the stops of black individuals were night was 94. And of those 94 individuals, about 57% were stopped when it was light and about 43% when it was dark. And if you compare that to white drivers, white drivers were much closer to a 50-50 rate. So the significant finding is really driven by that 57% of black drivers when it was light, 50% of white drivers when it was light. That's, that's the difference that the test is identifying in that result. So for some context that was really important is that it was 94 stops over the course of the time period. Um, so a, a lower number of stops. And then thinking about too, how many stops would need to happen when it was dark compared to when it was light to balance this out, that gets even lower. Um, and so even though we did have this significant finding and the 2.7 is significant, it was a proportion of these 94 stops really driving that particular finding um, in 2021. And then same information now for 2022, we do not have, we are not finding a difference in the rate of stopped individuals um, in daylight compared to darkness. So again, that um, table on the bottom right has the same information for the more recent year. And you can see that those percentages are much closer. So for black drivers, about 39% when it is light. And then for white drivers, it's about 42%. So it's much closer range there, not finding that difference in the analysis of the report. Um, and you can see that the counts are similar too. We have the 102 stops for black drivers over, over that time period as well. And so the, the volume has stayed consistent. And then the, the trends there have, um, changed enough to no longer find that significant difference in the comparison that was done for Milwaukee. Okay. So well, that's just good news. Just to clarify, is, is that 102 number, is that for the 12 month period or a 24 month period? That's a 24 month period. So that's all the stops in that evening hour range. About, Which was four hours? About 4.30 to 8.30 30. over okay. a two-year period. Over a two-year period, okay. I would say that this reflects on all the hard work that Chief Luke and the department is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep, I agree. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I will add from my perspective that Chief Stray has been very engaged in this program that the state has done. Um, there's not a requirement for agencies to ask us to dig into the details and present to present to the group um, and, and engage with that. And um, he, he has really spent a lot of time um, from our perspective wanting to better understand the, the data that is um, showing the trends of the findings of the report. All right. right, if people have any questions. I'll say I've got a final, for those that want more information, I've got some information here on the final slide, which I think you all have. Um, we have a data dashboard up on our website and the results of other all the other agencies across the state. And we do do this every year. So the next report will come out December, 2023. And this program is now designed to, to happen every year. With and what's your data year then? Uh, it goes through, the reporting goes through the end of June. Okay, so it's so like we'll a fiscal year. So we'll have data year. through the okay. end of June 2023 in the December 
okay. December report. Okay. Um, COVID, you know, COVID is interesting. We see we see the trends in the traffic stop volume of the COVID restrictions and case counts and all that. And so um, things can change now post COVID in what's happening with the, um, with the stop data trends. Uh, there have been some law changes and some case law decisions that are changing things. Um, and so the the report happens every year for for the very purpose of kind of continuing to analyze the data and catching um, emerging trends if they're showing disparities in those outcomes. Great. Questions, anyone? No, no question, just a comment. Oh, so just to piggyback off of Council President Nicodemus and what he said, I mean, those numbers don't go down by themselves. Right. I mean, it's just not like, well, we'll, we'll just see and watch these numbers. They'll go, they'll eventually come down. Now it takes work and it, it takes a lot. And I think it's, you know, just our, our respect and admiration for, for our chief wanting to do the work. And this is the result of doing the work, realizing that there is an issue, uh, acknowledging that issue, and then taking the proper steps to find out how to solve that issue. Uh, and, and equity is work. Equity is work. And it's, it's very much appreciated because it starts at the top, so thank you. I agree. I, I, I have a question. Uh, you know, let me echo those uh, those uh, sentiments about the good work. Uh, and I know that the, this is I know that this is what you've done here when you're you know, doing, doing multivariate uh, statistics. It gets complicated. But when when I just look at these numbers, and let me just start at the upper right. And that says inner twilight window stops. And so the total stops is 115 to 186. And for simplicity, I'll just say it's 1 to 10. Okay. Uh, and I know that, uh, you know, there's all kinds of issues going through here. People traveling through Milwaukee on, on the 99 and, the, and, you know, the expressway and everything like that. So it's not like these are all residents. And I understand that. But if I just factor in the fact that uh, the African-American population of Oregon is less than 10%, it's still high. And so I want to say the African-American population of Oregon is what, 4%, something like that? Mm -hmm. Two, less than that? Yeah, my, my, yeah. My, might be 2.6. Yeah. yeah. So it's just an observation. It's good information, but there's still something going on there. Would you agree? I would agree, yeah. So, and I, I will say this table is looking at just black and white stops. Right. And so I, you know, you think you'd want all the groups. I couldn't in, agree in, more. In, but, but your point would hold that the proportion of stops of black individuals is going to look higher than the population. And I think that's that's consistent with, with other agencies. Um, and that is a challenge there. Um, there's some um, emerging research coming out of COVID that, um, you know, black and Latinx or Hispanic folks did not have opportunities to remote into work or work from home. Right. Um, the disparities we see of even just the public health metrics that's of COVID a, very, are pretty a, strong. Yeah. So I think we, we see that in, in driving patterns. Um, very good observation. And we, yeah. See, yeah. we see those things. So. Um, Yes, we there is an overrepresentation of of um, black and his and Hispanic folks that are um, stopped for officer initiated traffic stops, um, and I, I think that's that's pretty undeniable. Um, and the, our analysis is really trying to kind of use this uh, more robust statistical modeling to kind of look at what what decisions uh, that office that of the decisions that officers make can we identify areas that are problematic within that. Um, and so it is kind of zeroing in on that component. Um, and I think if you pull it out, uh, yeah, there are a lot of other other challenges that, that come through with, with that. Interesting report and, and good direction by the police department. Yep. I would just add one thing. I was sitting here thinking, why do they, why is it perceived race? And I'm like, it's on my license. It's not on my license. So that's, so maybe like add that in so people, because I, I, I was totally thinking that my race was on my license. So maybe put that as a qualifier. That's why police officers have to do that. 
is do the perceived thing. Sure. But I think my Arizona driver's license had my rights. Or is that a, do you know if that's a standard thing that, I mean, my eyes are on here and what used to be my hair color was on one. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not honestly sure about the other states. But yeah, I know it's not provided for Oregon. And it also, the officer has to choose one category. It doesn't, there's no option to choose multiracial, mm -hmm. um, which the demographics generally break it down into multiracial categories. So there's a difference in how your demographics are normally broken down and how stops demographics are broken down. So since that data would be self-reported at the DMV, it, maybe what we could do is add that to our lobbying effort or our legislative conversations to see if we can get someone to carry a bill at the state to make that fix. And then it would take the subjectivity out oh, yeah. of the perceived data and give um, law enforcement more of an opportunity to look at decision points objectively rather than through perceived data. <laughs> Interesting point. Um, not asking questions. Don't worry. Are you I just because <laughs> I felt your eyes. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this is an incredible amount of work. And um, what I was referring to earlier with the relative rate index, this is the index analysis that I was talking about. So to be able to compare. Um, these proportions in communities of color as compared to stop data within white populations, it gives us the ability to look at the disproportionality. It gives us an ability to look at anything higher than one or, you know, oops, sorry, whatever the, the I think it's, what did you say your threshold was? 1.11? Mm -hmm. Um, I just really appreciate that. It gives us the ability and within um, the police department, the ability to look at decision making and how that changes across um, interactions that folks have. So thank you for your work. All right, other comments, questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you. coming. Thank you. And let's take a seven minute break and come back at five till eight uh, and go on to our last few agenda items.
All right, everyone, we are back from a little break and we have senior planner Vera Colius here for round two of our discussion on psilocybin code amendments. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me back. Um, continuing this conversation that we had back in February, um, just as a brief reminder, um, so ballot measure 109 was the Oregon Psilocybin Service Act, which was passed um, and allows uh, manufacture, delivery, and administration of psilocybin mushrooms at licensed facilities. Um, OHA began accepting applications in January um, when I was listening to OPB on my drive here. Um, they have issued two manufacturing licenses as of now. So that's what we've got so far. Um, so there are some options for what the city can do um, as a municipality when it comes to psilocybin facilities. Um, the city can prohibit licensed manufacturers or service centers that would require a vote at an election, um, or the city can impose time, place, manner restrictions on, um, and on licensed facilities. Um, and so if it's not, if um, facilities come to the city um, and it's not prohibited in our code, uh, then the city issues what's called a land use comp compatibility statement. Um, to the applicant, which is part of their application package to the state when they want to seek their license. OHA issues four types of licenses, uh, a service center, which is where you go to seek treatment. Um, a service facilitator is the person who is providing that treatment to the patient. Uh, product manufacturer is the grower of or processor um, of the psilocybin, and then a testing facility is a testing facility of the actual product itself. Okay. The state law does have some base restrictions as established within the ORS. Um, so psilocybin is not available in stores or to take home. So it's not, re it's not a retail product like cannabis is. Um, it can only be administered in licensed settings. Um, there are locational restrictions uh, for service centers within the state law. So they are prohibited within residential zones in a community um, of an incorporated city, um, and they cannot be located within 1,000 feet of a school. And so that's actually in the statute. That's, in the that's statute. not just in, in regs, that's in the statute. That's in the statute, yep. Okay. Um, and then in manufacturing of psilocybin products, so growing of the psilocybin mushrooms is prohibited outdoors. So there aren't any locational restrictions for growers um, or manufacturers, um, but they cannot be outdoors. So they do need to be in closed spaces and they have very specific, the package for becoming a licensed manufacturer is something like 50 pages long and there are a bunch of rules um, and requirements for what your facility has to have um, in order to be able to be a grow facility. So following our discussion um, last, last time, um, there were some issues raised regarding psilocybin manufacturing facilities in our residential zones as home occupations. That was kind of the specific um, aspect that's a little bit unique about our code. Our home occupations code is pretty um, flexible um, for home-based businesses. Um, and right now, um, a small grow facility would be able to be permitted as a home occupation, as long as it meets our um, current um, requirements or regulations for home occupations. Um, so to address those issues that came up, um, staff is, um, based, based on that discussion, um, staff is, pro, um, is proposing a code amendment that would prohibit any psilocybin related business as a home occupation. That mimics what our current code talks about uh, for marijuana related businesses. It's the exact same language. We would just kind of copy it and, and um, replace marijuana related businesses with psilocybin related, um, related businesses. And that um, we think um, would address some of the concerns that the police department raised as far as you know, security and, and those kinds of issues for, for manufacturers in, in the residential zones. So, um, so that's our proposal um, as it relates to that. So that underlined section that you see there on the, on, the, on the slide would be the new language that we would propose to insert as part of a code amendment um, process. Um, Happy to answer any questions. I'm going to pause because there's a couple more things to chat about. But does this kind of get to um, what we're thinking for, for the code amendments? I have a question. Please. So can you remind me, did somebody apply? Yes. For, okay. That yes. So we have issued at, at the city <laughs> level, we have provided a signed Lux form for one manufacturer as a home occupation. Yes. 
That's it so far. And that's it. That's it so far. For home occupations. Okay. Correct. Yes. But have we had applications or requests for LUX for treatment centers we or have, any of the other? No, no. Not, not for a treatment center, um, for a service center. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, all the statues have different words for things. So service center, no. Um, we did have someone um, ask for a LUX form for a manufacturer in our NMIA um, area, which is part of what the next part of the conversation will be, because that came up in between these work sessions. So we wanted to address that with you as well. Um, but no, this is the one that's specific to home occupations. Yeah. OK, questions? Oh, OK. All right. So the NMIA zone, so our North Milwaukee um, Innovation Zone. Um, so right now, um, and what you see on the slide is what um, we have right now for our marijuana regulations or for um, marijuana related businesses. So marijuana production um, or growers um, are a conditional use in the NMIA. Um, multiple producers are allowed to operate um, in a building. So we do have larger warehouse buildings there, um, but a single producer is limited to 10,000 square feet. So this is all kind of that came out of all of their marijuana regulations. And then when we re when we were redoing the NMIA zone, um, but then there is an added um, stipulation that a marijuana producer can't be located within a building that is within 1500 feet of another building that is utilized for marijuana production. And that all came out of all of that conversation about not wanting all of our manufacturing buildings and our warehouses to be occupied by um, marijuana producers. So, um, so this is what our current code has um, right now for marijuana production limitations for grow um, operations. So what we wanted to um, ask about as far as our options for discussion um, was kind of what direction would the council like to see um, psilocybin facilities um, go um, in the city? Um, specifically, um, do you, would you, we would like some direction on code amendments if that's where we go tonight. So um, two questions. Um, should we move forward with a code amendment that prohibits them as home occupations, um, all of the um, related businesses? Um, and are there any are there restrictions that you would like to see on manufacturers in the NMIA? Um, so those are kind of, if we're going to move forward with any kind of code amendments, these time, place, and manner restrictions, those are the two key questions. But you have other options for what you might want to do for psilocybin facilities. You could, again, of course, refer the ballot question to prohibit them completely um, in the city, or you could do nothing and let the state law sort of guide who can go where um, and, what they, and what they can do. Um, so we have a couple things to chat about, um, and you can give me some marching orders. If you <laughs> there was a question raised by Sergeant Burdick last time about the banking. Yeah. And do we know the answer to that? I will provide a qualified response because I'm not a banking professional. However, I did do a little bit of research and what I can what I can share is what, what the internet told me, um, which was um, there was some information that I found on a, from a couple of attorneys who, spe who specify on, um, in marijuana or cannabis related businesses in Oregon. Um, and they were drawing um, pretty clear comparisons between cannabis related businesses and psilocybin because it's such a new industry here. Um, but bottom line up front, it's they will likely be mostly cash businesses. It's really difficult to get have financial institutions handle, you know, schedule one type of products like this at the federal level. So there are, um, there are um, issues with finding that kind of banking services or financial services for marijuana related businesses. And they are drawing similar comparisons to psilocybin as well. So they are, they, what they were telling or what they were what the internet was telling me and as part of some of their papers that they were providing to their clients and so on was that it was likely to be difficult to have um, banking banking oh, services. services. Yeah, which is not unusual. It's the same for marijuana as well. And that's about all I like. I'm not an expert, but it seems likely that it will be mostly cash businesses just like the marijuana ones are. Yeah, I don't know if the state I mean, there have been talk off and on. I haven't seen anything this term about the state establishing some kind of state bank to yeah. support those businesses. It doesn't have to be FDIC insured or whatever, but um, yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, I was around on, 
I don't know if I was on the planning commission or I was on council, but when we talked about, I guess I was on council with the restrictions in the MIA and MIA. And you're right. I mean, they were largely about this idea and it was happening around the state. Like warehouses were just, you know, people were building giant grow facilities and, and warehouses were just all, you know, industrial areas were all turning over. And of course we all know the, market got oversaturated and a lot of those have, have closed down and blah, blah, blah. Plus, so I, I guess I don't see the worry that I think there was at that time applying to psilocybin. It, you showed a picture, it's, it grows yep. fairly compactly. Um, Small. And the number of licenses is gonna be way, way, way lower. There's no taking it home. There's, you know, all of those points you made. Um, so I guess I don't see a lot of reason to get into what size they are in our industrial zones personally, but anybody feel differently about that? I'm fine with it. everything that you propose. Okay. I don't have any worries. I mean, only one person's applied, so... Well, so everything that she's proposed, meaning, I mean, this packet yeah. suggests so the, the, the 10,000 square feet, the, like all of that, I am okay with. Um, Do you feel we need it, I guess, is the question. I would rather that we have it in place. That my, That's my feeling. I'd, I'd rather that it already be in place. Um, Okay. As opposed to letting the state decide, like if we already have something in place that folks can start if they want, or you know they know what they can do. Yeah, I, 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 I gotta, I agree with Council President Nicodemus. I, I'm, I would just rather have something, you know, already in place. So if it does, you know, who knows if it does become an oversaturation problem or if Milwaukee somehow becomes the hot spot for these places we're not you know we're not scrambling to figure out what to do I mean it, it we already have the infrastructure basically here we might as well just use the same parallel language yeah that's in place yeah um okay and same thing with restricting the uh home occupation I'm, I'm yeah I would I would okay. restrict that so I had a couple of questions uh just for context the third yeah. bullet Mm -hmm. But what was that designed to prevent a, a saturation of a lot of places? Is that yeah, yeah. multiple warehouse buildings all in a like okay. create a marijuana zone? I guess within the NMIA because we have so many, so there really needed to be. Okay, it was intended to be a limitation, frankly. On and the is number. it something you've had to invoke? It is, in yeah. fact, yeah. So we. As I'm, I have my mental map of the NMIA, and and I know at least at the time, I'm not sure. I believe they're still there. I, there's um, at, on Mailwell. Mm -hmm. There's one of those large um, warehouses, and then there's across on McBroad. There was a grow facility there, mm -hmm. and so that yep, they're they're 1,500 feet or more, and there we have it. So it kind of it almost kind of created sort of a um, an area, a zone where you couldn't have more basically. So they were pretty quick to rush and get in and kind of lock up the, lock up the, the space. Areas. Yeah. So yeah. The, the proposal is to prohibit all four categories as home? So this was, I the only proposal that, that we were bringing forward, frankly, was the home occupations. We're raising the question of the NMIA issue because we did have one come in and we wanted to, you know, kind of just highlight that, that we have specific limitations on producers only, grow <laughs> facilities in the NMIA. Processors can be wherever. Um, it's, it was very, this is really specific in the NMIA to the grow, to growers. So um, I guess, so our question would be, is, is the, would the council want to see a code amendment that's specific to growers of psilocybin that mimics this or, or not, um, or, something different, I guess. So this is, but these were kind of the specific, this is a, a unique um, sort of kind of code language that is regulating marijuana grow facilities. Well, I think and what I agree with is that we uh, copy and paste this one. <laughs> 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 yes. And so I, 
Yeah, I, I can understand that. But, but going back to my yeah. original question sure. on the four uses, yeah. that's all pro, pro, going to be, pro, well, we're talking about prohibiting all of those in home. Um, yes, yes. But I thought, home said, I thought you said we had a, we had a, uh, a permit request for one already. We did, but we don't have any code to prohibit it. So we have one Lux form for a grower as a home occupation okay. that we have issued. The yeah. state hasn't approved it, but, but we, we've yeah, got I mean, it, yeah. if that person had, if we if we make a code change like that and that person had applied six right. months down the road, right. it would have been denied. Correct. But right now, that person is grandfathered? Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they would be. We didn't have code yeah. to prohibit it, so they're in. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Counselor, you're, you haven't been heard from. Um, so, so go here. I actually, um, I don't have a problem with the um, with the state guidelines, um, but I think that I would also be fine if the consensus here is that we want to mirror something that would be in place for marijuana. Um, I think there. You know, obviously different substances, the regulation is different, the treatment is different, the quantities are different. Um, there, there's a lot, there's enough difference um, that I think that, you know, the work that the state has done um, meets my expectations. I don't think we should do anything more restrictive for this. Um, so I think, you know, I'm fine with either of those options. Okay. Okay, so what I'm hearing, let, let's take let's take these questions separately. Prohibit as home occupations. I'm hearing pretty universal support for that. Yes, you're. Yeah, you I, mean, I might be the not. dissenting vote on that, but that's fine. We don't all have to <laughs> vote the same way. The only thing that's allowed in a home occupation is a grow facility. The right. service yeah. centers just the other yeah, ones just for not. clarity, because there was a list of four up there, right. and right. they didn't. Yeah, right. So this is. Prohibit as a home occupation a grow facility? All of it. I mean, the, if we're mimicking our the marijuana language that we have, it's all psilocybin-related businesses would be prohibited as home occupations. The state law would not allow a service center to be in a residential zone anyway. So that kind of is a moot point. But this would just be sort of general language that any psilocybin-related business could not be a home occupation, any of the four could happen, including a grow facility. I mean, I do think because of the cash nature yeah. of the business, that's a wise policy, personally. Um, yeah. I might agree with Councillor Savinger, um, but I'm, I'm just wondering how much psilocybin are people, like, if you're starting up, because I'm guessing most startups most people, if you're going to start growing psilocybin, it's not going to be, you don't have like millions of dollars of cash to like get a big giant grow facility and they might start small and in right. their home. Well, and as a home occupation, it would, it would have to be, yeah. it still has to look and feel like a residential property. Yeah. There are limitations on yeah. how large the building can be. Yeah. Anyway, and you said the grow, the grow can't be in the home, though. Right. It has, to be, to, be a a it has to be a yeah, separate yeah. structure. Yeah. And the state law sets out all sorts of security uh, requirements and things like that. So you're yeah. the, the, they really, yeah. I felt yeah. like, yeah. really took a look yeah. at, hey, if you're going to do this as a home occupation, we're not going to stop you from the state perspective, but we're going to require you to adhere to a bunch of guidelines. OK. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so home occupation standards, Councillor Massey, are you for this proposed language about uh, prohibiting it as home occupation? Yes, I am. I, and, uh, you know, I think even though the, you know, the, I think the state has, um, you know, set out some, you know, some guidelines for control of that. Uh, that, that's all nice. It still becomes a law enforcement issue, you know? Right. Uh, and so um, I know that's why I would, um, I would go that route. Councilor, Council President, he's okay with that one. Okay. You are supportive of that. Yes. And you are not. I'm going to no, You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, 
Okay, so I think you have guidance okay. there. Yep. Then the NMI zone. So I get the point of the council president and councilor Coaster body about let's just parallel. But here, I guess in my mind, it's less needed. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the, the scale is, will be much smaller. Uh, the kind of things that were motivating this code aren't really at issue here, but I can live with making the parallel code. I just don't necessarily think we need it. I guess it is still the cash operation issue is still there. Um, but at least, I mean, it's not in a residential area, at least. Um, I don't know. Thoughts? Observations? I, I just look at it like better safe than sorry, um, especially with something so new. And, uh, you know, I mean, and I know, I know mushrooms are smaller, but you got to think if somebody's going to, because, you know, the licensing from the state is a arduous pro process. So whoever's going to put the time in, they're most likely are going to put a decent amount of money into something like this because of what they're required, like the licensing requirements, the insurance requirements, the, um, just add, like what you're, what you're required to have. They don't make, it's not like, it's, it's not like marijuana, how it was, it's, it's a lot bigger. So it's like, I feel like if you're going into this and you're going to do it, you're going to go all the way. You're not just going to test the waters. So with that said, it would just be better to have this in place. Cause without it, I don't, I mean, with it, we're just, I just feel like we're just a little bit more squared away than without it. Okay. Um, and I just don't, I, I would just rather err on the side of caution in the event that we do get caught off guard with something. Um, what if a massive, you know, cause I've heard, for, and just, I've talked to people in California who are interested in what we're doing up here, right? So right. who knows if those, you know, you have multi-million dollar investors who did the same thing with marijuana to do that. And I, and I get it that the restrictions are there, but again, because those restrictions are there, you're probably going to most likely have people who are serious about doing a bigger grow up than something in that picture where it's in a bucket. That's like a, you know, that, that, that's like a personal use type of thing. You know what I mean? That's not something where you're manufacturing uh, on a scale like that. So with, with these in place, at least we're there. And if we happen to run into an issue where this, this is hurting those businesses and, and the patients they're trying to treat, then it's, then it's helping, then maybe we can revisit it. But I, I rather err on that side. Okay. And not. Others? Uh, I'm good. And if you're in agreement with keeping doing a parallel. Okay. I'm okay with this. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds like we have consensus. Okay. All right. You'll be seeing me at some point. In a few <laughs> <minutes coming up. laughs> that was it. No more questions? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, we'll do this and okay. see where we go. All right. Great. Thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we have our legislative and regional issues. Mr. Stauffer has. Um, yes. Mayor and council put my slides to have a brief um, update on the legislative session. <laughs> Um, as council is aware, April 4th, that is today, big, big deadline uh, for legislation pending in Salem. Had to have a, a work session by today. And so when I checked things this morning, there were quite a few uh, that had nothing else scheduled and there were probably, we've seen the last of them and a lot of them uh, had hearings today. So uh, just some highlights from the list of the legislation that council and staff have been tracking. As, as you may know, HB 2001 was adopted. So that was a big, big one put to bed. Um, HB 3167 allows electronic notices. It says first reading, I should say first reading. First reading was today. And then a series, a whole bunch of third readings were held today. So first reading means it's on the floor. It's gotten out of committee and it's on the floor. It's being read to the, I guess, house, if it's a house bill. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and I, I presume to mean, I assume that means that it's still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and then third readings, it's almost, they're almost done is what I think, I, I, what I've seen those before. So 
those are where those are. And then the ones that had a bunch of hearings today, uh, quite a list. So I don't know if council wanted to talk about any of them. Um, I pulled this from various, the list we had, and then I saw updates that came in over spring break and whatnot, so. Well, I will just say that um, I had an email exchange with a few people on staff trying to figure out. So HB 3414 and HB, one that's not on that list, uh, 3569, with both had some uh, housing things that did away with variances and did a lot of things that I think were pretty lousy. Um, both were passed out of committee without a recommendation so, and passed to the rules and the, and in one case it was rules plus ways and means committee. And I asked if that meant it, they were dead and they were sent there to die. And I got kind of um, conflicting information on that. Um, and the city manager has her hand raised too. Okay. Um, I, uh, Mayor, I had a chance to check in actually with our former uh, assistant city manager since she has a pretty good read right now on most of these bills. Um, she said that those two are probably both not dead. They are both probably just in process. So um, we should continue to watch them as bill numbers. Okay, she didn't have any prognosis about timelines or anything for them. Okay. No. Okay. Um, so I think that was the legislation. The other things that um, have been presented for council, there were two requests for council to consider. One is uh, for the HB 3201 coalition, and I can pull up both these items, but asking to add a logo to Right, HB 3201 was a, is a bill to, that's already passed the House, but it's going to the Senate to um, basically uh, synthesize Oregon's broadband approach in a way that'll make us best able to capitalize on the federal money for broadband. Um, to be honest, a lot, I mean, a lot of that is focused on rural and underserved areas and we're probably not going to stand to benefit, um, but you never know. And a lot of cities have signed on. Um, and so I just put it out there if we want to, um, you know, look like a good uh, supportive player and, and add our name to that. Um, I don't see a downside. Um, and I told, yeah, anyway, so I told the mayor of Sherwood I would, I would raise it at our meeting. Um, so. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine too. I'm fine yeah, with I'm, that. I can support this. And... Okay, great. Well, we will add our, uh, add our seal to the, to the letter. Okay, that was easy. And then the other one that the city manager over uh, passed along um, is for I-205 tolling and and I don't know if you want to say anything else on it. Yeah, I'm happy to. So this request has come from Clackamas County. Um, we have not had an in-depth conversation about tolling on this team, and we could have that. The letter itself is relatively ambiguous about whether or not tolling is good or bad, or we support it or we don't. It is a statement that they'd like ODOT to do additional outreach around tolling um, and that they feel like there needs to be more community conversation. Um, it's really a, uh, just a question to you all of, do you want to sign on to something like that at this time or would you rather wait? Well, I would ask, um, I imagine this has been a topic in C4, so. It has. <laughs> <laughs> so I would ask uh, Councillor Stavenjord for her views on yeah, as our um, representative to C4. It has been a topic of C4. I think that um, as you all may not be surprised, um, sometimes Milwaukee's perspective on things varies from other cities, other urban cities even that are represented at C4. So um, <clears throat> I think it's, um, I think that, um, that we could 
support this. Um, and, um, you know, I guess the thoughts that I have about tolling in general and the impact on Milwaukee are very different than the, the feelings that I have about the benefits of tolling and, um, or, or the challenges with tolling. So I don't necessarily have a problem with us signing on to that. Um, I, I am interested to hear what others think uh, because, you know, some of you have been involved in those conversations longer than I have. Um, and I know that counselor, former counselor Heisey was our representative to C4. So I'm trying to catch up as quickly as I can in those conversations. But those, those conversations um, largely circle around issues with tolling. And I will say the last council didn't really have any real robust conversations about tolling either. Um, you know, we're not the place that's gonna be most impacted by tolling. I do occasionally hear from residents that no, no tolls, no tolls. Um, you know, I grew up in a state where there's lots of toll roads. <laughs> and then I lived in Washington, DC, where there's lots of toll roads up and down the East Coast. Um, so I am not personally averse to tolls. I think they're not a bad way to fund your infrastructure. They're a user fee. They are a user fee. The people who use it pay for it. Um, but I do appreciate the concerns of, you know, Oregon City and other cities that, um, that don't feel like they've gotten satisfactory answers to mitigation efforts yeah. and to why, why first, why not do all the tolling in the region, you know, at once, why should I 205 be first? Yeah. I mean, the, those, especially in conversations around the regional transportation plan and all of the approved projects, I mean, there's definitely a dialogue that has gone back and forth about, you know, whether tolling would come first or some of these other projects and, and the lens for tolling that may be put on these projects, especially those that are adjacent to 205. Um, I agree with you in terms of the ideological, you know, the opinions around tolling. I don't, as long as there's a robust plan for, um, for, low income, you know, like tolling or some, some mitigation or, or, you know, fund to provide passes, um, for low income communities. Um, you know, I think that this is one of the growing pains that, that we're experiencing in the metro area. Um, I do also understand that, you know, our freeways were built many times through communities. And while those have filled in around the freeways, there's still the impact of not only, you know, how that has impacted communities, but has divided those communities. And there's not often a lot of space, you know, around those, around those, um, like around that infrastructure. So, I mean, that, comes to mind a little bit too, where we're, we're trying to like grow into the density and the traffic congestion that we have uh, in the region. And uh, sometimes that does mean like looking at strategies that aren't just building out, looking at improving the, the infrastructure that we have in place. Um, so I, I am also like very last thing here. Um, I think that it, the expansion of the timeline. They've extended the timeline for input um, around um, around the equity analysis of this, and I appreciate that. And I know that Rep Hartman's office has also called for a more extensive analysis of um, of equity as you know a, as a consideration, a factor, and a and like and a value on tolling. So I um, I think that's an important move, and I hope that the legislature hears that. So I don't, I don't know what others are thinking with regard to this. Well, One moment, Scott, can you do me a favor and just scroll up on the letter, the, the, nope, sorry, the other direction. Um, 
I just want to make sure that people see the four points that are specifically called out to make sure that you don't have concerns. So two of them are about timing. One of them is about um, formula. At, the last one is is really the one I want you to look at and make sure you're comfortable with it, which is saying there should be a formula that allocates tolling revenues directly to impacted jurisdictions. I, I don't think that that is necessarily something you agree with or disagree with. It's just something I wanted to also call out in the letter. Thanks. I mean, that other point, the first one on the list, pause it to align it with the regional mobility pricing program, you know, sort of is the main point I've been hearing from other cities. I mean, I don't see anything too concerning about, you know, two, three, and four. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, thoughts? Anybody have? Yeah, I, I can I can support this letter, and and I, I will tell you I I'm I'm not an expert on the whole tolling issue, but you know just just my you know from what I've read, it's um, you know I it's almost like ODOT has set this course, uh, you know, for this section and everything else. Uh, is they've just got their mind made up. And that, that's my impression. And um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about what, you know, my perceived uh, perception of how ODOT is going about this. And I, I don't understand the whole, the, you know, the whole thing. I know what tolling is designed to do, okay? Uh, but I don't understand, you know, the, the big picture of this one little section, and I just don't hear anything else about anything else but that one little section. That's all I hear. And, you know, I, so I don't get it. I don't get what the big plan is. And I, that's my concern. I, I could, I, obviously I could support this, and I, I'm, I'm where Councillor Massey is, I, you know, I get it, you know, you pay for infrastructure, but that's what our taxes pay for. I mean, that's what, that's literally what we pay taxes for, is to pay for infrastructure. And it's like, you're this is basically tolling people to get to work. Like, you're basically charging people to drive to work, right? And it's like, everybody, the people already have gas and everything else, it's already cost people money to get to work in the first place. And maybe I'm behind on this, but has there been, I mean, are any of the funds going to any enhancement in, in public, transit infrastructure like are they putting a, a line along that bottleneck of the of the of a trimet line that can go to s some of these places that we don't have before so, i mean are they are they expanding any public transit if, they, if they're just doing it for the sake of the bottleneck i mean it's interesting that was actually a point of former mayor gamba was he wanted to tie it to i wasn't that much involved in these discussions but i remember this vaguely. Um, he wanted to tie it to adding a bus lane on 205, like adding a, a, you know, a dedicated bus lane or something. He was trying to tie it to some transit options that got people out of their cars. And, and, um, and, that, and that's the thing. It's, it's just, you know, like I, I get how we have to pay for infrastructure and things like that, but I mean, I just don't think that tolling right now is, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's not going to impact, the, the traffic issue is not going to impact Milwaukee because people have to already cut through Milwaukee to get to the 205 anyways, right? So, you, I mean, it's not really going to impact us in that sense, but the greater region, it's, it's going to impact Milwaukeeans who live here but have to use the 205 to get to work and pay that extra cost. And it's just, you know, I just don't like the way they're going about this. Um, nothing is going to, public transit transit infrastructure. It's just to expand the bottleneck. And it's like, you know, the state touts itself about climate and this and that, and it's like, then you have an opportunity to do something like this for public transportation. And you, you know, we, we, we take two steps, you know, one step forward and take two steps back in a way. It's just, I, I think this is, I, I get why they're doing it, but I don't, the, the tolling part is like, really? I mean, we're, we're squeezing everything we can out of people, man. It's, it's, 
You know, use the kicker money. Yeah, change that. I didn't see any money back from the kicker. Most, most working people that do is like 75 bucks anyway, so. I don't know. I, I'm with it. I, I just get frustrated with how they go about. It's just always take more. Take more. And like Councilor Massey said, they're just, they're going to do what they're going to do. They're not, at the end of the day, we can ask for all this, but is ODOT really going to stop? Are they going to put in a public transit line? Well, I'll just, I'll just add this oh, real ahead. quick. I can, I can get behind this. And, and this is in the dig at you. I wish people would get, I wish people would be as passionate about expanding I-5 and displacing communities of color as they do about having to pay a toll. Like I grew up where there are tolls. <laughs> Those roads were actually really great to drive on, but you know, I just, we're more worried about paying a toll than displacing entire communities for a larger freeway. And I just wish more people were vo more vocal about that than this. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, I, I do want to comment on um, the C4 and the Metro, the C4 Metro Committee are hearing updates from ODOT and TriMet, TriMet around regional transportation projects, about expanded services. I think that the, the conversation um, does include advocacy for increased transit. Um, so I feel like that, I mean, maybe not increased, <clears throat> maybe not like a line that runs exactly parallel to the, to the freeway because that I think gets to the council president's point about, you know, cutting further into communities. but in terms of tr transit or um, or transit transportation enhancements, I, I feel like that conversation is happening. Um, I will say about this last point, point four, um, I remember in the meeting there being a, a specific um, delineation between the um, allocated tolling revenues um, after, after paying off projects and, and things like that, going to um, adjacent jurisdictions to, to reduce congestion. Um, I don't remember that going that um, conversation going into um, either transit related or offsetting costs for individuals. Um, so I will look for that in future meetings. And if I hear that conversation or a lack thereof, I'll, I'll bring it up. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So do I understand correctly that everybody's okay with signing on with this letter? I think that's what I heard. Yeah. Okay. So can I ask one quick question, Mayor? Mm -hmm. It sounds like tolling may be something we want to talk about a little bit more um, on one of these agenda topics. Um, Joseph isn't here tonight, and I have also um, told Councillor Stavenyard that I'm going to try and go to some more of these conversations prior to having that discussion with you all, just to make sure that I have an update um, that is fully, fully vetted um, with the experts out in the field. Um, but we are thinking that we should probably bring something back here in the next month or two. So we will try and bring something in just as an informational update. It may come in the form of a memo, but I do think that some discussion probably is warranted amongst you all about where you want to go. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, regarding the other bills that were on the list, I mean, I don't think there's so there's going to be like a lot of shaking out the rest of this week after these last two days of, of hearing. So um, we'll just have to watch the other bills. And um, I suspect next, you know, two, two weeks from now, we will need to have a more robust discussion and we will need to have some letters ready to uh, consider. But at this point, we don't even know what we need to write letters about. So, um, I don't think there were other things unless somebody else has other things on the legislative front. Nope. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll close out. You didn't have anything else for us? Okay. We'll close out the uh, legislative and regional issues part of it. Any council reports on meetings attended, et cetera? Nope. Okay. 
No, we have um, C4 t uh, Thursday night. Okay. So um, I'll take good notes. <laughs> And I thought, I thought the DAC met tomorrow, but unfortunately the DAC meets Wednesday, next Wednesday. I, I was mixed up about which Wednesday they meet. So, okay. yeah. Let's see. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, with that, I guess I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. I second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No one ever says no to this one. Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>